Hello, and welcome back to Classics with Katie. We are still reading Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. We left off at chapter 18. Till Elizabeth entered the drawing room at Netherfield and looked in vain for Mr. Wickham among the cluster of red coats there assembled, a doubt of his being present had never occurred to her. The certainty of meeting him had not been checked by any of the, those recollections that might not unreasonably have alarmed her. She had dressed with more than usual care, and had prepared in the highest spirits for the conquest of all that remained unsubdued of his heart, trusting that it was not more than might be worn in the course of the evening. But in an instant arose the dreadful suspicion of his being purposely omitted for Mr. Darcy's pleasure in the Bingley's invitation to the officers. And though this was not exactly the case, the absolute fact of his absence was pronounced by his friend, Mr. Denny to whom Lydia eagerly applied, and who told him that Wickerham had been obliged to go to town on business the day before, and was not yet returned, adding with a significant smile, I do not imagine his business would have called him away just now if he had not wished to avoid a certain gentleman here. This part of his intelligence, though unheard by Lydia, was caught by Elizabeth, and as it assured her that Darcy was not less answerable for Wickham's absence than it, if her first summarize had been just. Every feeling of displeasure against the former was so sharpened by immediate disappointment that she could hardly reply with tolerance, tolerable civility to the polite inquiries which she, he directly afterwards approached to make. Attention, forbearance, patience with Darcy, was injured to work on. She was resolved against any sort of conversation with him and turned away with a degree of ill humor which she could not fully surmount even in speaking to Mr. Bingley, whose blind partiality provoked her. But Elizabeth was not formed for ill humor, and though every prospect of her own was destroyed for the evening, it could not dwell long for her, on her spirits. And having told all her griefs to Charlotte Lucas, whom she had not seen for a week, she was soon able to make a voluntary transition to the oddities of her cousin, and to point him out to her particular notice. The two first dances, however, brought a return of distress. They were dances of mortification. Mr. Collins, awkward and solemn, apologizing instead of attending, and often moving wrong without being aware of it, gave all of the shame and misery which a disagreeable partner for a couple of dances can give. The moment of her release from him was ecstasy. She danced next with an officer, and had the refreshment of talking of Wickerham, and of hearing that he was universally liked. When those dances were over, she returned to Charlotte Lucas and was in conversation with her, when she found herself suddenly addressed by Mr. Darcy, who took her so much by surprise in his application for her hand that without knowing what she did, she accepted him. He walked away again immediately, and she was left to fret over her own want of presence of mind. Charlotte tried to console her. I dare say you will find him very agreeable. Heaven forbid, that would be the greatest misfortune of all, to find a man agreeable whom one is determined to hate do you not wish me such an evil? When the dancing commenced, however, and Darcy approached to claim her hand, Charlotte could not help cautioning her in a whisper, not to be a simpleton and allow her fancy for Wickerham to make her appear unpleasant in the eyes of many a man of ten times in consequence. Elizabeth made no answer and took her place in the set, amazed at the dignity to which she was arrived in being allowed to stand opposite to Mr. Darcy, and reading in her neighbor's looks their equal amazement in beholding it. They stood for some time without speaking a word, and she began to imagine that their silence was to last through the two dances, and at first was resolved not to break it, till suddenly fancying that it would be the greater punishment to her partner to oblige him to talk. She made some slight observation on the dance. He replied, and was again silent. After a pause of some minutes, she addressed him a second time with, It is your turn to say something now, Mr. Darcy. 
I talked about the dance and you ought to make some kind of remark on the size of the room or the number of couples. He smiled and assured her that whatever she wished him to say would be said. Very well. That reply will do for the present. Perhaps by and by I may observe that private balls are much pleasanter than public ones. But now we may be silent. Do you talk by rule then while you are dancing? Sometimes. One must speak a little, you know. It would look odd to be entirely silent for half an hour together. Yet for the advantage of some, conversation ought to be so arranged as that they may have the trouble of saving as, saying as little as possible. Are you consulting your own feelings in the present case, or do you imagine that you are gratifying mine? Both, replied Elizabeth archly, for I have always seen a great similarity in the turn of our minds. We are each of an unsocial, tacticum disposition, unwilling to speak, unless we expect to say something that will amaze the whole room and be handed down to prosperity with the all eclat of a proverb. This is no very striking resemblance of your own character, I am sure, said he. How near it may be to mine, I cannot pretend to say. You think it is a faithful portrait, undoubtedly. I must not decide on my own performance. He made no answer, and they were again silent till they had gone down the dance when he asked her if she and her sisters did not very often walk to Meryton. She answered in the affirmative, and unable to resist the temptation, added, When you met us there the other day, we had just been forming a new acquaintance. The effect was immediate. A deeper shade of haunter overspread his features. But he said not a word. And Elizabeth, though blaming herself for her own weakness, could not go on. At length, Darcy spoke, and in a constrained, constrained manner said, Mr. Wickham is blessed with such happy manners as may ensure his making friends. Whether he may be equally capable of retaining them is less certain. He has been so unlucky as to lose your friendship, replied Elizabeth with emphasis, in a manner which he is likely to suffer from all his life. Darcy made no answer, and seemed delirious of changing the subject. At that moment, Sir Luke William Lucas appeared close to them, meaning to pass through the set to the other side of the room, but on perceiving Mr. Darcy, he stopped with a bow of superior cur courtesy to compliment him on his dancing and his partner. I have been most highly gratified indeed, my dear sir. Such very superior dancing is not often seen. It is evident that you belong to the first circuit. Allow me to say, however, that your fair partner does not disgrace you, and that I must hope to have this pleasure often repeated, especially when a certain desirable event, my dear Miss Elsa, glancing at her sister in Bingley, shall take place. What well, congratulations will then flow in? I appeal to Mr. Darcy, but let me not interrupt you, sir. You will not thank me for detaining you from the bewitching converse of that young lady, whose bright eyes are also abrading me. The later part of this address was scarcely heard by Darcy, but Sir William's allusions to his friend seemed to strike him forcibly, and his eyes were directed with a very serious expression towards Bingley and Jane, who were dancing together. Recovering himself, however, shortly he turned to his partner and said, Sir William's interruption has made me forget what we were talking of. I do not think we were speaking at all, Sir William could not have interrupted any two people in the room who had less to say for themselves. We have tried two or three subjects already without success, and what we are to talk of next I cannot imagine. Books, oh no, I am sure we never read the same, or not with the same feelings. I am sorry you think so, but if that be the case, there can at least be no want of subject. We may compare our different opinions. No, I cannot talk of books in a ballroom. My head is always full of something else. The present always occupies you in such scenes, does it? Said he with a look of doubt. Yes, always, she replied, without knowing what she said, for her thoughts had wandered far from the subject. As soon afterwards appeared by her suddenly exclaiming, 
I remember hearing you once say, Mr. Darcy, that you hardly ever forgive, that your resentment once recreated was unappeasable. You are very cautious, I suppose, as to its being created. I am, said he with a firm voice. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice. I hope not. It is particularly incumbent on those who never change their opinion to be secure of judging properly at first. May I ask to what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character, said she, endeavoring to shake off her gravity. I am trying to make it out. And what is your success? She shook her head. I do not get on it at all. I hear such different accounts of you as a puzzle me exceedingly. I can readily believe, answered he gravely, that reports me very greatly with respect to me. And I could wish, Miss Bennet, that you were not to sketch my character at the moment. As there is reason to fear that the performance will reflect no credit on either. But if I do not take your likeness now, I may never have another opportunity. I would by no means suspend any pleasure of yours, he coldly replied. She said no more, and they went down the other dance and parted in silence, on each side dissatisfied, though not to an equal degree, for in Darcy's breast there was a tolerable powerful feeling towards her, which soon procured her pardon and directed all of his anger against another. They had not long separated when Miss Bingley came towards her, and with an expression of civil disdain thus accosted her. So, Miss Liza, I hear you are quite delighted with George Wickham. Your sister has been talking to me about him, asking me a thousand questions, and I find that the young man forgot to tell you, among his other communications, that he was the son of old Wickham, the late Mr. Darcy Stewart. Let me recommend you, however, as a friend, not to give implicit confidence to all his assertions. For as to Mr. Darcy's using him ill, it is perfectly false. For on the contrary, he has been, has been always remarkably kind to him, though George Wickham has treated Mr. Darcy in a most infamous manner. I do not know the particulars, but I know very well that Mr. Darcy is not in the least to blame, that he cannot bear to hear George Wickham mentioned, and that though my brother thought he could not well avoid including him in his invitation to the officers, he was exceedingly glad to find that he had taken himself out of the way. His coming into the country at all is a most insolent thing indeed, and I wonder how he could pleasure to presume to do it. I pity you, Miss Liza, for this discovery of your favorite's guilt. But really, considering his descent, one could not expect much better. His guilt and his descent appear by your account to be the same, said Elizabeth angrily, for I have heard you accuse him of nothing worse than of being the son of Mr. Darcy Stewart, and of that, I can assure you, he informed me himself. I beg your pardon, replied Miss Bingley, turning away with a sneer. Excuse my interference. It was kindly meant. Insolent girl, said Elizabeth to herself. You are much mistaken if you expect to influence me by such a partially attack as this. I see nothing in it but your own willful ignorance and the malice of Mr. Darcy. She then sought her eldest sister, who had undertaken to make inquiries of the same subject of Bingley. Jane met her with a smile of such sweet complacency and a glow of such happy expression as sufficiently marked how well she was satisfied with the occurrence of the evening. Elizabeth instantly read her feelings, and at that moment solitude for Wickerham, resentment against his enemies, and everything else gave way before the hope of Jane's being in the fairness way for happiness. I want to know, said she, with a countenance no less smiling than her sister's, what you have learnt about Mr. Wickham. But perhaps you have been too pleasantly engaged to think of any third person, in which case you may be sure of my pardon. No, replied Jane. I have not forgotten him, but I have nothing satisfactory to tell you. Mr. Bingley does not know the whole of his history and is quite ignorant of the circumstances which have principally offended Mr. Darcy, but he will vouch for the good conduct 
and the probity in honor of his friend, and is perfectly convinced that Mr. Wickham has deserved much less attention from Mr. Darcy than he has received. And I am sorry to say that by his account as well as his sister's, Mr. Wickham is by no means a respectable young man. I am afraid he has been very imprudent and has deserved to lose Mr. Darcy's regard. Mr. Bingley does not know Mr. Wickham himself. Now, he never saw him till the other morning at Maryton. This account, then, is what he has received from Mr. Darcy. I am satisfied. But what does he say of the living? He does not exactly recollect the circumstances, though he has heard them from Mr. Darcy more than once, but he believes that it was left to him conditionally only. I have not a doubt of Mr. Bingley's sincerity, said Elizabeth warmly, but you must excuse my not being convinced by assurances only. Mr. Bingley's deference of his friend was a very able one. I dare say, but since he is unacquitted with several parts of the story and has learned the rest from that friend himself, I shall venture still to think of both gentlemen as I did before. She then changed the discourse to one more gratifying to each and on which there could be no difference of sentiment. Elizabeth listened with delight to the happy, though modest hopes which Jane entertained of Bingley's regard and said all in her power to heighten her confidence in it. On that, on their being joined by Mr. Bingley himself, Elizabeth withdrew to Miss Lucas, to whose inquiry after the pleasantries of her last partner she had scarcely replied before Mr. Collins came up to him, and told her with great exultation that he had just been so fortunate as to make a most important discovery. I have found out, said he, by a singular accident that there is now in the room a near relation of my patroness. I happen to overhear the gentleman himself mentioning to the young lady who does the honors of this house the names of his cousin, Miss de Burrow, and of her mother, Lady Catherine. How wonderfully these sort of things occur. Who would have thought of my meeting with perhaps a nephew of Lady Catherine de Burrow in this assembly? I am most thankful that the discovery is made in time for me to pay my respects to him, which I am now going to do, and trust he will excuse my not having done it before. My total ignorance of the connection must plead my apology. You are not going to introduce yourself to Mr. Darcy. Indeed I am. I shall entreat his pardon for not having done it earlier. I believe him to be Lady Catherine's nephew. It will be in my power to assure him that her ladyship was quite well yesterday a sent night. Elizabeth tried hard to dissuade him from such a scheme, assuring him that Mr. Darcy would consider his addressing him without introduction as an impertinent freedom, rather than a compliment to his aunt, that it was not in the least necessary there should be any notice on either side, and that if it were, it must belong to Mr. Darcy, the superior in consequence to begin the acquaintance. Mr. Collins listened to her with a determined air of following his own inclination, and then when she ceased speaking, replied thus, My dear Miss Elizabeth, I have the highest opinion in the world of your excellent judgment in all manners within the scope of your understanding, but permit me to say that there must be a wide difference between the established forms of ceremony among the laity and those which relegate the clergy. For give me leave to observe that I consider the clerical office as an equal in the point of dignity with the highest rank in the kingdom, provided that a proper humility of behavior is at the same time maintained. You must therefore allow me to follow the dictates of my conscience on this occasion, which leads me to perform what I look on as a point of duty. Pardon me for neglecting the profit of your advice which on every other subject shall be my constant guide, though in the case before us I consider myself more fitted by education and habitual study to decide on what is right than a young lady like yourself. And with a low bow, he left her to attack Mr. Darcy, whose reception of his advances she eagerly watched, and whose astonishment at being so addressed was very evident. Her cousin prefaced his speech with a solemn bow, and though she could not hear a word of it, she felt as if 
hearing it all and saw in the motion of his lips the words Apology, Hunsford, and Lady Catherine de Rowe, and it vexed her to see him expose himself to such a man. Mr. Darcy was eyeing him with unrestrained wonder, and when at last Mr. Collins allowed him time to speak, replied with an air of distant civility. Mr. Collins, however, was not discouraged from speaking again, and Mr. Darcy's contempt seemed abundantly increasing with the length of his second speech, and at the end of it he only made him a slight bow and moved another way. Mr. Collins then returned to Elizabeth. I have no reason, I assure you, he said, to be dissatisfied with my reception. Mr. Darcy seemed much pleased with the attention, and he answered me with the utmost civility, and even paid me a compliment of saying that he was so well convinced of Lady Catherine's discretion as to be certain she would never bestow a favor unworthily. It was really a very handsome thought. Upon the whole, I am very much pleased with him. As Elizabeth had no longer any interest of her own to pursue, she turned her attention almost entirely on her sister and Mr. Bingley, and the train of agreeable reflections which her observations gave birth to made her perhaps almost as happy as Jane. She saw her in idea settled in that very house, in all the felicity which a marriage of true affliction could bestow, and she felt capable under such a circumstance of enduring even to like Bingley's two sisters. Her mother's thoughts, she plainly saw, were bent the same way, and she determined not to venture near her, lest she might hear too much. When they sat down to suffer, therefore, she considered it most unlikely perseverance, which placed them within one of each other, and deeply was she vexed to find that her mother was talking to that one person, Lady Lucas, freely, openly, and of nothing else but of her expectation that Jane would be soon married to Mr. Bingley. It was an animating subject, and Miss Bennet seemed incapable of fatigue while enumerating the advantage of the match. His being such a charming young man and so rich and living about three miles from them was the first point of self gratulation and then it was such a comfort to think how fond the two sisters were of Jane, and to be certain that they must desire the connection as much as she could. It was, moreover, such a promising thing for her younger daughters, as Jane's marrying so greatly must throw them in the way of other rich men, and lastly, it was so pleasant at her time of life to be able to consign her single daughters to the care of their sister that she might not be obliged to go into company more than she liked. It was necessary to make this circumstance a matter of pleasure, because on such occasions it is the equitate. But no one was less likely than Mrs. Bennet to find a comfort in staying at home at any period of her life. She concluded with many good wishes that Lady Lucas might soon be equally fortunate, though evidently and triumphantly believing that there was no chance of it. In vain did Elizabeth endeavor to check the rapidity of her mother's words, or persuade her to describe her felicity in a less audible whisper, for to her inexpressible vexation she could perceive that the chief of it was overheard by Mr. Darcy, who sat opposite of them. Her mother only scolded her for being nonsensical. What is Mr. Darcy to me, pray, that I should be afraid of him? I am sure we owe him no particular civility, as it is obliged to say nothing he may not like to hear. For heaven's sakes, madam, speak lower. What advantage can it be to you to offend Mr. Darcy? You will never recommend yourself to his friend by doing so. Nothing that she could say, however, had any influence. Her mother would talk of her views in the same unintelligible tone. Elizabeth blushed and blushed again with shame and vexation. She could not help frequently glancing her eye at Mr. Darcy, though every glance convinced her of what she dreaded. For though she, he was not always looking at her mother, she was convinced that his attention was invariably fixed by her. The expression of his face changed gradually from indigent contempt to a composed and steady gravity. 
At length, however, Mrs. Bennet had no more to say, and Lady Lucas, who had been long yawning at the repetition of delights which she saw no likelihood of sharing, was left to the comforts of cold ham and chicken. Elizabeth now began to revive, but not long was the interval of tranquility, for when supper was over, singing was talking, talked of, she had the mortification of seeing Mary, after very little entreaty, preparing to oblige the company. By many significant looks and silent entreaties did she endeavor to prevent such a proof of compliance, but in vain. Mary would not understand them. Such an opportunity of exhibiting was delightful to her, and she began her song. Elizabeth's eyes were fixed on her with the most painful sensation, and she watched her progress through the several stanzas with an impatience which was very ill rewarded at their close. For Mary, on receiving amongst the thanks of the table, the hint of hope that she might be prevailed on in favor of them again, at the pause of half of a minute, began another. Mary's powers were by no means fitted for such a display. Her voice was weak, and her manner affected. Elizabeth was in agony. She looked at Jane, and to see how she wore it, but Jane was very composedly talking to Bingley. She looked at her two sisters, and saw them making signs of desertion at each other, and at Darcy, who continued, however, imperatively grave. She looked at her father to entreat his interference, lest Mary should be singing all night. He took the hint, and when Mary had finished her second song, said aloud, They will do extremely well, child. You have delighted us long enough. Let the other young ladies have time to exhibit. Mary, though pretending not to hear, was somewhat discounted, and Elizabeth, sorry for her, and sorry for her father's speech, was afraid her anxiety had done no good. Others of the party were now applied to. If I, said Mr. Collins, were so fortunate as to be able to sing, I should have great pleasure, I am sure, in obliging the company with an air, for I consider music as a very innocent diversion, and perfectly compatible with the profession of clergyman. I do not mean, however, to assert that we can be justified in devoting too much of our time to music, for there are certainly other things to be attended to. The rector of a parish has much to do. In the first place, he must make such an agreement for this as many be beneficial to himself and not offensive to his patron. He must write his own sermons, and the time that remains will not be too much for his parish duties. In the care and improvement of his dwelling, which he cannot be excused from making as comfortable as possible. I do not think of it of light importance that he should have attentive and conciliatory manners towards everybody, especially towards those to whom he owes his preferment. I cannot acquit him of that duty, nor could I think him of the man who should omit occasion of testifying his respect towards anybody connected with the family. And with a bow to Mr. Darcy, he concluded his speech, which had been spoken so loud as to be heard by half the room. Many stared, many smiled, but no one looked more amused than Mr. Bennet himself, while his mouth seriously commended Mr. Collins for having spoken so sensibly and observed in a half whisper to Lady Lucas that he was a remarkably clever, good-looking young man. To Elizabeth it appeared that she had her family made an agreement to expose themselves as much as they could during the evening, it would have been impossible for them to play their parts with more spirit or finer success. And happy did she think of it for Bingley and her sister that some of it exception had escaped his notice and that his feelings were not of a sort to be much distressed by the folly which he must have witnessed. That his two sisters and Mr. Darcy, however, should have such an opportunity of re ridiculing her relations was bad enough, and she could not determine whether the silent contempt of the gentleman or the insolent smiles of the ladies were more intolerable. The rest of the evening brought her little amusement, she was teased by Mr. Collins, who continued most perversely by her side, and though he could not prevail with her to dance with him again, put it out of her power to dance with the others, 
in vain did she entreat him to stand out with somebody else and offer to introduce him to any young lady in the room. He assured her that as to dancing, he was perfectly indifferent to it, and that his chief object was to do was by delicate attentions to recommend himself to her, and that he should therefore make a point of remaining close to her the whole evening. There was no arguing upon such a sub project. She owed her greatest relief to her friend, Miss Lucas, who often joined them and good naturally engaged Mr. Collins' conversation to herself. She was at least free from the offense of Mr. Darcy's further notice, and though often standing within a very short distance of her, quite disengaged, he never came near enough to speak. She felt it to be the probable consequence of her allusions to Mr. Wickham and rejoiced in it. The Longford party was the last of the, all the company to depart, and by a maneuver of Mrs. Bennet had to wait for their carriage a quarter of an hour after everyone else was gone, which gave them time to see how heartily they were wished away by some of the family. Mrs. Hurst and her sister scarcely opened their mouth, except to complain of fatigue, and were evidently impatient to have the house to themselves. They repulsed every attempt of Mrs. Bennet at conversation, and by doing so, threw a languor over the whole party, which was very little relieved by the long speeches of Mr. Collins, who was complimenting Mr. Bingley and his sisters on the elegance of their entertainment, and the hospitality and the politeness of which had marked their behavior to their guests. Darcy said nothing at all. Mr. Bennet, in his equal silence, was enjoying the scene. Mr. Bingley and Jane were standing together, a little detached from the rest, and talked only to each other. Elizabeth preserved a steady a silent as either Mrs. Hurst or Miss Bingley, and even Lydia was too much fatigued to utter more than the occasional exclamation of, Lord, how tired I am, accompanied by a violent yawn. When at length they were rose to take a leave, Mrs. Bennet was most pressingly civil in her hope of seeing a whole family soon at Longbourn, and addressed herself particularly to Mr. Bingley to assure him how happy he had made them by eating a family dinner with them at any time without the ceremony of a formal invitation. Bingley was all grateful pleasure, and he readily engaged for taking the earliest opportunity of waiting on her. After his return from London, and whither he was obliged to go the next day for a short time, Mrs. Bennet was particularly satisfied and quitted the house under the delightful persuasion that, allowing for the necessary preparation of settlements, new carriages, and wedding clothes, she would undoubtedly see her daughter settled at Netherfield in the course of three or four months. Of having another daughter married to Mr. Collins, she thought with equal certainty, and with considerable, and though not equal, pleasure. Elizabeth was the least dear to her of all of her children, and though she, although the man and the match were quite good enough for her, the worth of each was eclipsed by Mr. Bingley and Netherfield. Chapter 19 The next day opened a new scene at Longbourn. Mr. Collins made his declaration in form. Having resolved to do it without loss of time, at, as his leave of absence, extended only to the following Saturday, and having no feelings of difference to make it dress distressing to himself even at the moment, he set about it in a very orderly manner, with all the observances which he supposed a regular part of the business. On finding Mrs. Bennet, Elizabeth, and one of the younger girls together, soon after breakfast, he addressed the mother in these words, May I hope, madam, for your interest with your fair daughter, Elizabeth, when I solicit for her the honor of a private audience with her in the course of the morning. Before Elizabeth had time for anything but a blush of surprise, Mrs. Bennet instantly answered, Oh dear, yes, certainly. I am sure Lizzie will be very happy. I am sure she can have no objection. Come, Kitty. I have you upstairs. And gathering her work together, she was hasting away. When Elizabeth called out, Dear madam, do not go. I beg you will not go. Mr. Collins must excuse me. He can have nothing to say to me that anyone not here. I am going away myself. 
No, no, nonsense, Lizzie. I dare desire you will stay where you are. And upon Elizabeth's seeming really, with vexed and embarrassed looks, about to escape, she added, Lizzie, I insist upon your staying and hearing Mr. Collins. Elizabeth would not oppose such an injunction, and a moment's consideration, making her also sensible that it would be wisest to make it get it over as soon and as quietly as possible. She sat down and tried to conceal by incident employment the feelings which were divided between distress and diversion. Mrs. Bennet and Kitty walked off, and as soon as they were gone, Mr. Collins began. Believe me, my dear Miss Elizabeth, that your modesty is far, so far from be doing you any disservice, rather adds to your other perfections. You would have been less amiable to my eyes had there not been this little unwillingness. But allow me to assure you that I have your respected mother's permission for this address. You can hardly doubt the purport of my discourse. However, your natural delicacy may lead you to dissemble. My attentions have been too marked to be mistaken. Almost as soon as I entered the house, I singled you out as the companion of my future life. But before I am run away with by my feelings of this subject, perhaps it would be advisable for me to state my reasons for marrying, and moreover, for coming into Hedwardshire with the design of selecting a wife, as I certainly did. The idea of Mr. Collins, with all his solemn composure, being run away with his feelings, made Elizabeth so near laughing that she could not use the short pause he allowed in it any attempt to stop him further, and he continued, My reasons for marrying are, first, that I think of it as a right thing for every clergyman in easy circumstances, like myself, to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly, that I am convinced it will add very greatly to my happiness. Thirdly, which perhaps I ought to have mentioned earlier, that it is particularly advice and recommendation of the very noble lady whom I have the honor of calling patroness. Twice she has consent consented to give me her opinion, honest to, on the subject, and it was but the very Saturday night before I left Hunsford, between our pools at Quadril, while Mrs. Jenkins was arranging Miss Burrow's footstool, that she said, Mr. Collins, you must marry. A clergyman like you must marry. Choose properly, choose a gentlewoman for my sake, and for your own. Let her be an active, useful sort of person, not brought up high, but able to make a small income go a good way. This is my advice. Find such a woman as soon as you can. Bring her to Hunsford, and I will visit her. Allow me, by the way, to observe my fair cousin, that I do not reckon the notice and kindness of Lady Catherine de as amongst the least of the advantages in my power of offer. You will find her manners beyond anything I can describe, and your wit and necessity, I think, must be acceptable to her, especially when tempered with a silence and respect which her rank will inventively excite. Thus much of my general intention in favor of matrimony. It remains to be told why my views were directed to Longburn instead of my own neighborhood. For I assure you there are many amiable young women. But the fact is, with that being as I am, to inherit the state after the death of your honored father, who, however, m may live many years longer, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters, that the loss to them might be as little as possible. When the melancholy event takes place, which, however, as I have already said, may not be for several years, this has been my motive, my fair cousin, and I flatter myself it will not sink me in your esteem. And now nothing remains for me but to assure you in the most animated language of the violence of my affection. To fortune I am perfectly indifferent, and shall make no demand of that nature of your father, since I am well aware that it could not be compiled with, and that one thousand pounds in four persons, which will not be yours till after your mother decease, is all that you may ever be entitled to.
On that head, therefore, I shall be uniformly silent. You may assure yourself that no ungenerous reproach shall ever pass my lips when we are married. It was absolutely necessary to interrupt him now. You are too hasty, sir, she cried. You forget that I have made no answer. Let me do it without further loss of time. Accept my thanks for the compliment you are paying me. I am very sensible of the honor of your proposal, but it is impossible for me to do otherwise than decline them. I am now, not now to learn, replied Mr. Collins with a formal wave of his hand that it is unusual with young ladies to reject the address of a man whom they secretly mean to accept when he first applies to the favor and that sometimes the refusal is repeated a second or even a third time. I am therefore by no means discouraged by what you have just said and shall hope to lead you to the altar ere long. Pa, my word, sir, cried Elizabeth. Your hope is rather an extraordinary one after my declaration. I do assure you that I am not one of those young ladies, if such young ladies there are, who are so daring as to risk their happiness on the chance of being asked a second time, I am perfectly serious in my refusal. You cannot make me happy, and I am convinced that I am the last woman in the world who can make you so. Nay, were your friend Lady Catherine to know me, I am persuaded she would find me in every respect ill-qualified for the situation." We're certain that Lady Catherine would think so, said Mr. Collins very gravely, but I cannot imagine that her ladyship would at all disapprove of you. And you may be certain that when I have the honor of seeing her again, I shall speak in the highest terms of your modesty, economy, and other amiable qualifications. Indeed, Mr. Collins, all praise of me will be unnecessary. You must give me leave to judge for myself and pay me the compliment of believing what I say. I wish you a very happy and rich life, and by refusing your hand, do all in my power to prevent you being otherwise. In making me the offer, you must have satisfied the delicacy of your feelings with regard to my family, and may it take a possession of Longbourn Estate whenever it falls, without any self reproach. This matter may be considered, therefore, as finally settled. And rising as she thus spoke, she would have quitted the room had not Mr. Collins thus addressed her. When I do myself the honor of speaking to you next on the subject, I shall hope to receive a more favorable answer than you have now just given me. Though I am far from accusing you of cruelty at present, because I know it to be the, dis the established custom of your sex to reject a man on the first application, and perhaps you have even now said as much to encourage my suit as would be constant with the true delicacy of the female character. Really, Mr. Collins, cried Elizabeth with some warmth, you puzzle me exceedingly. If what I have here to have said can appear to you in the form of encouragement, I know not to express my refusal in such a way as may convince you as its being one. You must give me leave to flatter myself, my dear cousin, that your refusal of my dress is merely words of course. My reasons for believing it are perfectly these. It does not appear to me that my hand is unworthy of your exception, acceptance, or that my, the establishment I can offer would be any other than highly desirable. My situation in life, my connection with the family of Deborough, my relationship to your own, are, cir are circumstances highly in my favor, and you should take it into further consideration that in spite of your man manifold attractions, it is by no means certain that another offer of marriage may ever be made for you. Your portion is unhappily so small that it will be in all likelihood undo the effects of your loveliness and amiable qualifications. As I must therefore conclude that you are not serious in your rejection of me, I shall choose to attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense according to the usual practice of elegant females. I do assure you, sir, that I have no pretense whatever to that kind of elegance, which consists in tormenting a disreputable man. I would rather be paid the compliment of being believed sincere. I thank you again and again for the honor you have done me in your proposals, but to accept them is absolutely impossible. 
My feelings in every respect forbid it. Can I speak plainer? Do not consider me now as an elegant female, intending to plague you, but as a rational creature, speaking the truth from her heart. You are uniformly charming, cried he, with an air of awkward gallantry, and I am persuaded that when sectioned by the express authority of both your excellent parents, my proposals will not fail on being acceptable. To such perseverance in willful self-deception, Elizabeth could make no reply, and immediately and in silence withdrew, determined that if he persisted in considering her repeated refusals as flattering encouragement to apply to her father, whose negative might be uttered in such a manner as much must be decisive, and whose behavior at least could not be mistaken for the affection and corkery of an elegant female. Chapter 20. Mr. Collins was not left long to the silent complication of his successful love for Miss ben Mrs. Bennet. After having dawdled about in the vestibule to watch for the end of the conference, no sooner saw Elizabeth opening the door with a quick step past her towards the staircase when she entered the breakfast room and congratulated both him and herself in warm terms on the happy prospect of their near connection. Mr. Collins received and returned these felicitations with equal pleasure, and then proceeded to relate the particulars of their interview, with the result of which he trusted he had every reason to be satisfied, since the refusal which his cousin had steadfastly given would naturally flow from her bashful majesty and the genuine delicacy of her character. This information, however, startled Mrs. Bennet. She would have been glad to be equally satisfied that her daughter had meant to encourage him by protesting against his proposals, but she dared not believe it, and could not help saying so. But depend upon it, Mr. Collins, she said, and Lizzie shall be abroad to reason. I shall speak to her about it myself directly. She is a very headstrong, foolish girl, and does not know her own interests, but I will make her know it. Pardon me for interrupting you, madam, cried Mr. Collins. But she is really headstrong and foolish. I know not whether she would altogether be a desirable wife to a man in my situation, who naturally looks for happiness in the marriage state, if therefore she actually persists in re rejecting my suit. Perhaps it is, it were better not to force her into accepting me, because it is it liable to such defects of temper she could not contribute you much to my felicity. Sir, you quite misunderstand me, said Mrs. Bennet, alarmed. Lizzie is only headstrong in such manners as these. In everything else, she is a good-natured girl as ever lived. I will go directly to Mr. Bennet, and we shall very soon settle it with her, I am sure. She would not give him time to reply, but hurrying instantly to her husband, called out as she entered the library, Oh, Mr. Bennet! You are wanted immediately. We are all in an uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him, and if you do not make haste, he will change his mind and not have her. Mr. Bennet raised his eyes from his book as she entered and fixed them on her face with calm unconcern, which was not in the least altered by her communication. I have not the pleasure of understanding you, said he when she had finished her speech. But what are you talking? Of Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins, and Mr. Collins begins to say that he will not have Lizzie. And what am I to do on the occasion? It seems a hopeless business. Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her that you insist upon her marrying him. Let her be called down. She will hear my opinion. Mrs. Bennet rang the bell, and Miss Elizabeth was summoned to the library. Come here, child, cried her father as she appeared. I have sent for you on an affair of importance. I understand Miss, Mr. Collins has made you an offer of marriage. Is it true? Elizabeth replied that it was. Very well, and this offer of marriage you have refused? I have, sir. Very well. We now come to the point. Your mother insists upon your accepting it. Is it not so, Mrs. Bennet? Yes, or I will never see her again. An unhappy internal alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. 
Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. And I will never see you again if you do. Elizabeth could not smile as such a conclusion of such a beginning. But Mrs. Bennet, who had persuaded herself that her husband regarded the affair as she was, was exceedingly disappointed. What do you mean, Mr. Bennet, by talking in this way? You promised me to insist upon her marrying him. My dear, replied her husband, I have two small favors to request. First, that you will allow me the free use of my understanding on the present occasion. And secondly, of my room, I shall be glad to have the library to myself as soon as I may be. Not yet, however, in spirit of her disappointing her husband, did Mrs. Bennet give up the point. She talked to Elizabeth again and again, coaxed and threatened her by turns. She endeavored to secure Jane in her interest, but Jane, with all of her possible malice, declined interfering, and Elizabeth, sometimes with her real earnestness and sometimes with playful gaiety, replied to her attacks. Though her manner varied, and however, her determination determination never did. Mr. Collins, meanwhile, was meditating in solitude on what had passed. He thought too well of himself to comprehend on what motive his cousin would refuse him. Though his pride was hurt, he separated in no way. His regard for her was quite imaginary, and the possibility of her deserving her mother's reproach prevented his feelings any regret. While the family were in this conf confusion. Charlotte Lucas came in to spend the day with them. She was met in the festival by Lydia, who, flying to her, cried a half whisper, I am glad you are here, come here, for there is such fun here. What do you think has happened this morning? Mr. Collins has made an offer to Lizzie, and she will not have him. Charlotte had hardly time to answer before they were joined by Kitty, who came to tell the same news, and no sooner had they entered the breakfast room where Mrs. Bennet was alone, then she likewise began on the subject, calling on Miss Lucas for her compassion, and entreating her to persuade her friend Lizzie to comply with the wishes of her family. Pray do, my dear little Miss Lucas, she added in a melancholy tone, for nobody is on my side. Nobody takes part with me. I am cruelly used. Nobody feels for my poor nerves. Charlotte's reply was spared by the entrance of Jane and Elizabeth. Ay, there she comes, continued Mrs. Bennet, looking as unconcerned as may be, and carrying no more glass than if she were at York, provided she can have her own way. But I tell you what, Miss Lizzie, if you take it into your head to go on refusing every offer of marriage in this way, you will never get a husband at all, and I shall I am sure I do not know who is to maintain you when your, hus your father is dead. I shall not be able to keep you, and I so warn you. I have done with you from this very day. I told you in the library, and you know that I never will speak to you again, and you will find me as good as my word. I have no pleasure in t talking to you undutiful children. Not that I have much pleasure, indeed, in talking to anybody, People who suffer as I do from nervous complaints can have no great inclination for talking. Nobody can tell what I suffer, but it is also but it is also so. Those who do not complain are never pitied. Her daughters listened in silence to this effusion, sensible that the, any attempt to reason with or soothe her would only increase the irritation. She talked on, therefore, without interruption from any of them, till they were joined by Mr. Collins, who entered with an air more stately than usual, and perceiving whom, she said to the girls, Now, I do insist upon it that you, all of you, hold your tongues, and let Mr. Collins and me have a little conversation together. Elizabeth passed quietly, quietly out of the room. Jane and Kitty followed, but Lydia stood her ground, determined to hear all she could, and Charlotte, detained first by the civility of Mr. Collins, whose inquiries after herself and her, all of her family were very minute, and then by the little curiosity, satisfied herself with walking to the window and pretending not to hear. In a doleful voice, Mr. Mrs. Bennet thus began the 
projected conversation. Oh, Mr. Collins, my dear madam, replied he, let us be forever silent on this point. Far be it from me, he presently continued, in a voice that marked his displeasure, to resent the behavior of your daughter. Resignation to inventable evils is the duty of us all. The particular duty of a young man who has been so fortunate as I have been in early performance, and I trust I am resigned. Perhaps not the less so from feeling a doubtful of my positive happiness had my fair cousin honored me with her hand, for I have often observed that resignation is often perfect, as when the blessing denied begins to lose somewhat of its value in our estimation. You will not, I hope, consider me as showing any disrespect to your family, my dear madam, by thus withdrawing my presentation to your daughter's favor, without having paid yourself and Mr. Bennett the compliment of requesting you to interpose your authority on my behalf. My conduct may, I fear, be objectable in having accepted my dismission from your daughter's lips instead of your own, though we are all liable to error. I have certainly meant well through the whole affair. My object has been to secure an amiable companion for myself and with the due consideration for the advantage of all of your family. And if my manner has been at all reprehensible, I here beg leave to apologize. Chapter 21 the discussion of Mr. Collins' offer was not nearly at an end, and Elizabeth had only to suffer from the uncomfortable feelings necessarily attending it, and occasionally from some peevish illusions of her mother. As for the gentleman himself, his feelings were chiefly expressed not by embarrassment or deduction or by trying to avoid her, but by stiffness of manner and resentful silence. He scarcely ever spoke to her and the audacious attentions which he had been so sensible of himself were transferred for the rest of the day to Miss Lucas, whose civility in listening to him was a seasonable relief to them all, and especially to her friend. The morrow produced no abatement of Mrs. Bennet's ill humor or ill health. Mr. Collins was also in the same state of angry pride. Elizabeth had hoped that his resentment might shorten his visit, but his plan did not appear in the least affected by it. He had always to have gone on Saturday, and to Saturday he still meant to go stay. After breakfast, the girls walked to Meryton to inquire if Mr. Wickham were returned, and to lament over his absence from the other ball. He joined them on their entering their room and attended them to their haunts, where his regret and vexation and the concern of everybody was well talked over. To Elizabeth, however, he voluntarily acknowledged that the necessity of his absence had been self-imposed. I found, said he, as the time drew nearer that I had better not meet Mr. Darcy, that to be in the same room and the same party with him for so many hours together might be more than I could bear, and it seems might arise unpleasant to him more than myself. She highly approved his forbearance, and they had leisure for a full discussion of it, and for all the commendation which they civilly bestowed on each other as Wickham and other and another officer walked back with them to Longmorn, and during the walk he particularly attended to her. His accompanying them was a double advantage. She felt all the compliment it offered to her, and it was most acceptable as an occasion of introducing him to her father and mother. Soon after their return, a letter was delivered to Miss Bennet. It came from Netherfield, and it was open immediately. The envelope contained a sheet of elegant, little, hot-pressed paper, well covered with a lady's flare, flowing hand, and Elizabeth saw her sister's countenance change as she read it, and saw her dwelling intently on some particular passage. Jane recollected recollected herself soon, and putting the letter away, tried to join with her a usual cheerfulness in the general conversation. But Jane Elizabeth felt an anxiety on the subject which drew off her attention even from Wickerham. And no sooner had he and his companion taken leave 
Then a glance from Jane invited her to follow her upstairs. When they had gained their own rooms, Jane, taking out her letters, said, This is from Caroline Bingley. This is containing... This, what it contains has surprised me a great deal. The whole party has left Netherfield by this time and are on their way to town and without any intention of coming back again. You shall hear what it, she says. She then read the first sentence aloud, which comprised the whole information of their having just resolved to follow their brother to town directly and of their meeting to dine that day in Gosner Street, where Mr. Hurst has a house. The next was in these words. I do not pretend to regret anything I shall leave in Hesper's side, except your society, my dearest friend. But we will hope it at some future period to enjoy many returns of that delightful intercourse we have known, and in that, meanwhile, may lessen the pain of separation by a very frequent and most unreserved correspondence. I depend on you for that. To these flown expressions, Elizabeth listened with all the insensibility of distrust. And though the suddenness of their removal surprised her, she saw nothing of it really to limit. It was not to be supposed that their absence from Netherfield would prevent Mr. Bingley's being there. As it to the loss of their society, she was persuaded that Jane must cease to regard it to the enjoyment of his. It is unlucky, said she after a short pause, that you should not be able to see your friends before they leave the country. But may we not hope that the period of future happiness to which Miss Bingley looks forward may arrive earlier than she is aware, and that the delightful intercourse you have known as friends will be renewed with yet greater satisfaction as sisters. Mr. Bingley will not be detained in London by then. Caroline decidedly says that none of the party will return into Hedershire. This winter, I will read, to, read it to you. When my brother left us yesterday, he imagined that the business which took him to London might be concluded in three or four days. But as we are certain, it cannot be so. And at the same time, convinced that, convinced that when Charles gets to town, he will be in no hurry to leave it again. We have determined on following him hither, that he may not be obliged to spend his vacant hours in a com comfortless hotel. Many of my acquaintances have already, are already there for the winter. I wish I could hear that you, my dearest friend, had any intention of making one of the crowd. But of that I despair. I sincerely hope your Christmas in Hertford, sir, may abound in the gratitudes which that season generally brings, and that your views will be so numerous as to prevent your feelings the loss of the three of whom we shall deprive you. It is evident by this, added Jane, that he comes back no more this winter. It is only evident that Miss Bingley does not mean he should. Why will you think so? It must be his own doing. He is his own master, but you do not know all. I will read you the passage which particular hurts me. I will have no res reserves from you. Mr. Darcy is a patient to see his sister. And to confess the truth, we are scarcely less eager to meet her again. I really do not think Georgiana Darcy has her equal for her beauty, elegance, accomplishments, and the affection she inspires in Louisa and myself and heightened into something still more interesting from the hope we dare to entertain of her being here hereafter our sister. I do not know whether I ever before mentioned to you my feelings on this subject, but I will not leave the country without confining them, and I trust you will not esteem them unreasonable. My brother admires her greatly already. He will have frequent opportunity now of seeing her on the most intimate footing. Her relations all wish the connection as much as his own, and a sister partially is not misleading me. I think when I call Charles most capable of engaging any woman's heart, with all these circumstances to favor an attachment and nothing to prevent it, I am wrong, my dearest change, in indulging the hope of an event which will secure the happiness of so many.
What think you of this sentence, my dear Lizzie? said Jane as she finished it. It is not clear enough. Does it not expressly declare that Caroline neither expects nor wishes me to be her sister? And she is perfectly convinced of her brother's indifference? That if she suspects the nature of my feelings for him, she means most kindly to put me on my guard? Can there be any other opinion on this subject? Yes, there can, for mine is totally different. Will you hear it? Most willingly. You shall have it in a few words. Miss Finley sees that her brother is in love with you and wants him to marry Miss Darcy. She follows him to town in hope of keeping him there and tries to persuade him that he does not care about you. Jane shook her head. Indeed, Jane, you ought to believe me. No one who has ever seen you together can doubt this affection. Miss Bingley, I am sure, cannot. She is not such a simpleton. Could she have seen half as much love in Mr. Darcy for herself? She could have ordered her wedding dress. But the case is this. We are not rich enough or grand enough for them. She is the most anxious to greet Miss Darcy for her brother, from the notion that when they have been one intermarriage, she may have less trouble in achieving a second, in which there is certainly some annuity. I dare say it would succeed if Miss Bro were out of the way. But my dearest Jane, you cannot seriously imagine that because Miss Bingley tells you her brother greatly admires Miss Darcy, he is in the smallest degree less sensible of your merit than when he took leave of you on Tuesday, or that it will be in her power to persuade him that instead of being in love with you, he is very much in love with her friend. If we thought alike of Miss Bingley, replied Jane, your representation of all of this might make me quite easy. But I know the foundation is unjust. Caroline is incapable of willingly deceiving anyone. And all that I can hope in this case is that she is deceived herself. That is right. You cannot have started a more happy idea since you will not take comfort in mine. Believe her to be deceived by all means. You have now done your duty by her and must fret no longer. But my dear sister, can I be happy? Even supposing the best in accepting a man whose sisters and friends are all wishing him to marry elsewhere? You must decide for yourself, said Elizabeth. And if some upon mit mature deliberation, you find that the misery of dislodging his two sisters is more than equivalent to the happiness of being his wife, I'd advise you by all means to refute his, um, refuse him. How can you talk so, said Jane, faintly smiling. You must know that though I should be exceedingly grieved at their dis disprovation, I could not hesitate. I do not think you would. And that being the case, I cannot consider you, your situation with much compassion. But if he returns no more this winter, my choice will never be required. A thousand things may arise in six months. The idea of his returning no more, Elizabeth treated with the utmost contempt. It appeared to her merely the suggestion of Caroline's interested wishes, and she could not for a moment suppose those wishes, however openly or artificially, could not for a moment suppose uh, um, those wishes, however openly or artificially spoken, could influence a young man so totally independent of anyone. She represented to her sister as forcefully as possible what she felt on the subject and hence soon the pleasure of seeing the happy effect. Jane's temper was not desponding, and she was gratefully led to hope, though the difference of affection sometimes overcame the hope, and that Bingley could return to Netherfield and answer every wish of her heart. They agreed that Mrs. Bennet could only hear of the departure of the family without being alarmed on the score of the gentleman's conduct. Even this partial communication gave her heart a great deal of concern, and she bewildered it as exceedingly unlucky that the ladies should happen to go away just as they were all getting so intimate together.
after laminating it, however, at some length she had the consolation, and the conclusion of all was the comfortable declaration that though he had been invited only to a family dinner, she would take care to have two full courses. And I will leave you there this week. Join us next week for the next installment of Pride and Paradise.